All right, we can go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Kate Goldenring. I'm a software engineer at Fermion, where we're, we're really excited about building serverless WebAssembly applications. And so two of those words, serverless WebAssembly, are something we're really going to focus on today um, with the context of sustainability. So how can I have more sustainable cloud solutions? So to start off, we're going to talk about how serverless pr promises a sustainable future and um, how we're doing, what is serverless, so level setting on that. And then we'll talk about why we care about serverless from a sustainability context. And then we'll talk about how we're doing on it so far. Like our current solutions for serverless, are they achieving the aims that we have? And then enters WebAssembly, which could provide a way for serverless to achieve its potential. And then finally, there's going to be some demos at the end. We'll weave through a few and see how far we get in them. So to start out, uh, what is serverless? So you can think of it as two different definitions. For starters, it can be a type of application. So serverless applications tend to be event-driven. They're triggered by something, whether it's an HTTP request, a queue, maybe a change in a bucket. That'll trigger your event handler, your handler, and your serverless application. Uh, serverless applications also are stateless and ephemeral. So they last for a request, and then they're torn down. So they have a really fine-grained um, isolation where they're per request, you have one, and it goes back down. The other uh, definition of serverless is as a development model. So it's one wherein you focus on your business logic, and you don't have to think about writing HTTP services um, or any of the lower level resources that your ephemeral serverless um, application is connecting to, and your platform handles all of that complexity. And also, when you think of serverless, you might also think of FAST or functions as a service, and that's totally okay. So why should we care about serverless? So we mentioned one, focusing on business logic, and that's great for developer productivity. You can get what you want done faster. The other thing is faster scaling. If my unit is smaller, then I can have more precise and faster scaling. Beyond that, we have fine-grained isolation. So the best serverless unit is one wherein every single request gets its own isolated sandbox for just that one request. And then the next request has its own. And so you know for sure this request, is if, it, um, if something goes wrong with it, it won't affect the viability of the next request. And then the last two are really important ones to think about for sustainability. When you have all of, uh, that serverless aims to do, you have increased density. So you can host more applications on one piece of hardware if they can scale up and down really fast. And all that means is that we have better utilization of our hardware altogether. And so those two are the ones we're focusing on. And what that leads to when we need less hardware to do the same things, that's cost savings, which is great for people who care about costs. And then for other people, that's energy savings, which is great for the people who care about the carbon intensity of their software. So on that note, uh, how do I measure software carbon intensity? And the Green Software Foundation actually has a formula for this, which is great for if you want to evaluate your own software. And in its simplest reduction, it's really just how much carbon um, am I creating for each functional unit of my application. So that may be processing in order. And if we expand that out, this is the full formula. So software carbon intensity is the energy consumed by the entire system times the location-based marginal carbon intensity. And what that means is we know in the cloud where we have all these different regions that you can have um, better, you can use more sustainable sources of energy. So one way to make your software more uh, sustainable is by moving it to a different region that uses cleaner energy. So we're multiplying it by that factor. And then we're adding the embodied emissions. How many emissions were emitted in order to create my hardware? And then finally, that's all per functional unit of my software. And reducing that, so we went from this really reduced, expanded, down to one that we now can talk about for the rest of the presentation, um, we can really think about software carbon intensity as a function of operational emissions, so emissions per that my application puts out, and embodied emissions, so the hardware. So we want to reduce um, the energy um, used by our applications, and we also want to reduce the amount of hardware we need to, to run our applications. And the final thing is that carbon awareness and region shifting is a great thing to do uh, with your workloads. So how can I increase hardware efficiency. And the way you do that is by putting more applications on the same piece of hardware. But that makes people nervous, right? I don't want my application running next to someone else's. Um, I don't feel like my application's secure. 
Um, and so a really important part of multi-tenancy is being able to have your applications isolated from others. So the underlying unit of your serverless application needs to have a strong isolation property um, context, which we'll talk about a little bit. But when we do know that we can put these applications all together on the same piece of hardware, we can achieve multi-tenancy. And what multi-tenancy is, is it's just having multiple applications running in the same environment. And what it does is it brings the cost of a system closer to the value of a system. So the cost of a system is the short-term peak traffic. So you have to provision for the peak, while the value of the system is the average traffic. You can even think about that as billing models, like you're billing someone for the amount they use on average over a month. Um, and so we want to close this gap. And if you want to read an article about this, Mark Brooker, who works at AWS, has a really good article where he just talks about this, the economics of multi-tenancy. And so I wanted to kind of visually see this. I'm a visual person. So what I did is I randomly selected numbers between 1 and 10. And I did that for two functions. So we have two units that are running in our system here. And so at any given time, they have a different amount of load between 1 and 10. And the bottom two lines here are each of those two functions and their traffic throughout time 0 to 10. And you can see that the third line, the third moving line, is the sum of their use at any time. And then the top line is what is the peak at any point that I had to provision for? And that was around seven, 17. And then the lower line is what is the average at any time? And you can see that there's a ratio of 1.7. So my peak is 170 times more than my average. And so that's, that's a, a gap. That's not great. What happens if we add two more lines here? You can see that already the peaks and trials are starting to balance out into a line. And that now our peak is only 125% more than our average. And so that's just a really trivial example of how the more tenants we add to a system, the closer our peak gets to the average. And so if multi-tenancy is doing all that it can, it can help us achieve this hardware efficiency. So how are we doing at this right now in the serverless world? Uh, what are our current implementations of serverless? And how are they doing with this idea of being able to quickly scale up and scale down? So when you think of serverless, you might think of AWS Lambda. And Lambda's really brought in the world of serverless for us. Um, and they do a lot of great things for being able to, they use a, the Firecracker micro VM, which achieves that level of isolation we need for a multi-tenant system. However, these micro VMs are micro, but they're not that micro. So they still take quite a bit of time to start up. Um, they, it can take as long as 500 or even over a second sometimes, but it can take 500 milliseconds to start a micro VM. And that's a cold start, so from absolutely nothing to running. And so what they have to do is they have to pre-warm these instances. So even though you're not running that function, they'll basically have it in a, a state where it's ready to go. So they've kind of timestamped it and paused it. And that's using resources before you need it to. And even when it's pre-warmed, it still takes like 125 milliseconds to start from that warm state. And so the reality of this is that oftentimes the startup delay is actually even longer than the execution delay. So we're not achieving that scaling up and down of our functions that we're aspiring to. And we're just not getting that fast of systems in order to get people to want to adopt this serverless model. So, what a, um, so to look at that in more detail, um, this is from AWS Lambda's operator guide. And um, they said that only 1% of invocations have cold starts. Um, and that, they're saying that as a, don't worry, only 1% have cold starts. And they also mentioned that you're not paying for the pre-warmed instances. But as a cloud provider, someone has to pay for that, that resource usage. Um, and so what this is saying to me is that we're wasting a lot of resources. So you might switch to, what about containers? That's another way of isolating my workload from each other. How does that look in the serverless world? And Azure Functions is based on containers, and they have um, Microsoft Research looked into how they're doing and how is their, the cost of the, the um, serverless platform that they provide. And they find that in order to keep these containers warm and ready to go and serve um, and respond to requests, it's, the costs are prohibitively high. It's really hard to have... Um, uh, have Azure Functions work in a way where they are able to um, reduce costs because 81% um, of these functions are invoked one minute or less. So that means 
they have to keep it warm pretty much at all times because containers take longer to start. And so, but then they're not getting the payout because they're invoked so infrequently. Uh, so containers aren't really cutting it for us either. And then we can look at the world of Kubernetes, uh, which has a gap as well. So if we're thinking about this, we're over-provisioning systems because we need all these resources waiting to be used. So then we can't fit as many resources on the system. Um, and Kubernetes, only 69% um, of, on average, 69% of cores were unused. So that means we're only using a third of our CPU capacity on our nodes in Kubernetes. So we know we have a gap in Kubernetes that we need to close and that we need to be using more of these resources in our clusters. And I wanna emphasize this a bit more because this is something that I didn't realize, but that we have a non-proportionality of energy consumption. So actually when your um, computer is idle, it's using 30 to 60% of its power. And you can think of this almost as a bus and you wanna fill as many seats as possible on buses because when the bus is empty, it's still um, burning gasoline. And the more people you add to the bus, it's not actually causing you to burn much more gasoline, maybe a little because of the weight of people, but not that much. And actually that translates to servers. So when they're idle, they're using all, up to two thirds of all their resources. So we wanna put as many applications on there as possible. We don't wanna scale our, our cluster um, with more nodes. And so we can think of this as evolutions of uh, computation density or evolutions of multi-tenancy. We went from virtualization, which allowed us with um, virtual machines to add more tenants to a single host. Then we went to containers, where now we can um, add dozens of workloads to the same host. And then micro VMs with Lambda, now we can get up to 1,000. Um, and WebAssembly brings us even further in that evolution. And so, what is WebAssembly? So um, WebAssembly's name is interesting uh, because it has that word web in it. So it was originally intended for the web. It was made so that developers could write web applications in languages other than JavaScript. And you can compile it down to this universal bytecode or .wasm file. So any language of your preference, uh, there's, there's about over a dozen that you can compile to WebAssembly. And now you have this uh, binary that you can run anywhere you can put a WebAssembly runtime. And so that can be on x64, ARM, Windows, Linux, um, wherever, you can put that same bytecode there. And you can actually change your mind and move it somewhere else and you don't have to rewrite it or rebuild it. And beyond being portable, so we, and uh, beyond being portable, so no more cross builds either in our workflows, which is a side point of sustainability, WebAssembly uh, binaries are incredibly small. So while an ExpressJS application, if I were to containerize it, it would be maybe 200 to 400 megabytes, that WebAssembly artifact is about two megabytes. Um, so very small, which means that when we like push it up to registries, you can push it up to an OCI compliant registry. It's a lot smaller upload and download rates, faster upload and download rates. And then we get to the point of, can this work in a multi-tenant system? Is it sandboxed and isolatable? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, so the WebAssembly runtime manages this and what it does is it places a WebAssembly component in a, linear, in a, a sandbox in linear memory and there, it also has a posture called capability-based security, wherein a WebAssembly component only has access to the resources it has been explicitly granted access to. So it has access to no files, it can't even make an outbound HTTP request, it can't use data stores, unless the runtime is explicitly granted access to it. And altogether, uh, we talked about the startup times of containers and lambdas being quite slow. A WebAssembly component can start in less than a millisecond. And um, we've talked through some of the definitions that I've proposed for what makes a good serverless unit, but going back to kind of the authors who created the, the idea of serverless, which was those Lambda authors, when they were um, evaluating have they achieved their goals with serverless with AWS Lambda, they actually created six criteria of what does it mean to um, be a good serverless unit, something that can be multi-tenant and scalable. And they defined it as it needs to be isolated from other tenants, um, and you need to be able to have a large, um, a, a very high density within a single node, um, near native performance, so you shouldn't have to have performance costs by putting it in this isolated environment, and fast switching, which is the one we've been focusing on. What is that time from startup to tear down? Soft allocation, this one's really interesting. It's basically, I could put 1,000 functions on one machine, that and know that if all thousand were called at once, it can't handle it, but I'm guessing that they're not. 
And that's another benefit of this. You can play this kind of this gamble here that ideally is informed on user research that I can actually over commit resources knowing that traffic patterns aren't gonna be all at once. And finally, compatibility. I shouldn't have to change the way I develop in order to use this serverless unit. And so in that paper, they list out how the Firecracker micro VM satisfies all those criteria. Um, and so I went through and did that for WebAssembly. So both have a tight sandbox security, overhead and density. For the um, Firecracker micro VM, they were put, able to put thousands on a single node. Um, we at Fermion have a cloud for hosting serverless WebAssembly, and we needed to know how many nodes we needed in our Nomad cluster. And so we did some stress tests, and we were able to put um, thousands on a single node that had um, way less resources. So I want to say like five times less cores and uh, almost 10 times less RAM. Uh, so a, a lot higher degree of density. Both are near native. They're not native, but they're near native. Um, and fast switching. In the paper, they cited 125 milliseconds from startup to clean up, but that might have been a warm start too. I wasn't able to quite discern that. And then for WebAssembly, like we said, it's less than a millisecond. And then for soft allocation, they were able to do oversubscription rates of 10 times, which is really impressive. We did not test that in our cloud, though. And then for compatibility, uh, the micro VM is Linux and KVM only. Um, and it, but it is compatible with um, most of the, the libraries that you like. And the only requirement would be if you have uh, very specific hardware requirements. Um, WebAssembly is, like we talked about, it's OS and platform agnostic, so it's not tied to Linux or a specific hypervisor. Um, and the caveat here is that it only supports libraries that can compile to Wasm. So you need to make sure that your favorite libraries are supported by that ecosystem. So those are our requirements for serverless. Um, but what makes me actually want to use it? So what makes it adoptable as a developer? OK, I'm OK to use this. It's not a huge learning curve, or it doesn't require me to throw away all the things that I love about my toolkit. And that would be that it's language agnostic, so I shouldn't have to be confined to a certain number of languages. It should have a great developer experience, so an easy CLI to get going. I should be able to test it. I should be able to develop it locally on my workstation and then easily push it up to my production. It should be cr cross-platform. And this is a big part of this also is for region shifting, say, um, the green energy that you want to shift to is on ARM-based nodes, you shouldn't be tied to your x64 nodes. And then it should be portable, so I can easily package and distribute it in some way. So that gets me into, we've done a lot of talking about serverless, that gets me to, into, okay, how can I actually get started with WebAssembly, and is it this great developer experience? Um, and we're at Open Source Summit, and so I want to talk about SPIN, which is the open source project that I work on, and um, it is a developer tool for building these event-driven serverless WebAssembly applications. And it aims to provide that polyglot, um, really easy to get started developer experience. And um, you can see we have, you can go to the GitHub. And I also want to point out that if you are an open source contributor and you're seeing this um, and there's something you feel like is missing in SPIN, please put up an issue or contribute. Um, it really is aiming to fill, fulfill as many scenarios within the serverless landscape as possible. And spin as a CLI boils down to these three commands. So spin new, and you choose what language you want to build your application in. Spin build, you now have your .wasm file. Spin up, now it's running locally. And we'll talk about how that expands into other environments later. So I'm going to go ahead and demo that. Um, so I have spin downloaded already. Let's see how this is doing on size. I think that's probably OK. And so, like I was saying, spin new. We have all these different languages that we can template out an application in. We'll go with JavaScript because more JavaScript developers than anyone else out there. And we can pick a name for our application. So we can say, hello, Open Source Summit. We'll say, my first spin app. And here's where we can say, so this application, as you can see, is triggered by an HTTP request. Um, by default, our templates will do that, or you can choose a Redis template to have it triggered by a Redis uh, message in a queue. Um, but within that trigger, you can also specify what path on the request. So let's pick a, a path of hello on our endpoint. And now you can see that we have a project that's been scaffolded for us. 
So just to look at it real quick, this is our application manifest. This describes our WebAssembly application here. Um, and it has one component. You can expand this to end many components, but we're gonna have one .wasm file as a part of the spin application. And it is triggered by an HTTP request on the route, um, hello. And so let's go ahead and look at our implementation that's been um, scaffolded for us. So this is um, quite simple. It just gets an HTTP request and it's just gonna respond, uh, return a um, hello from JSSDK. Let's personalize this a little. And then our next thing we're gonna do is a spin build. That's our second command. Oh, and um, I forgot that because this is JavaScript, I need to first install my dependencies. So I'm gonna do, you can do an npm install or it's gonna prompt me for that. Yeah, so I need to do an npm install. And now I'll have my JavaScript dependencies installed and now I can do spin build. Great. And now we have our spin application built and we can actually see if we, um, that is our spin application. And actually, let's just look at the size of it. Uh, three megabytes. So that is our um, spin application there. And then we can do a spin up. And now we're running locally. And I can just go ahead and let's go ahead and curl that. And hello from Open Source Summit. So that was our quick um, developer experience for getting started with WebAssembly. And as I mentioned, you can do more than have this triggered by HTTP requests. It can be triggered by events in a Redis queue, by SQS messages. You can actually directly trigger it, so um, just invoke it directly. This is helpful in the Kubernetes context for sidecars. Um, you can also have it subscribe to an MQTT topic and have it be triggered by that. And then finally, um, Spin has a whole plugin system, so you can plug in your own trigger as well. So for example, MQTT and SQS were plugins that we, um, and you can install with Spin plugin install um, in order to get that trigger as well. So we saw this locally, um, my local development experience for my WebAssembly application, but where can I put this, where can I scale it and get those serverless benefits? Um, so locally I can use Spin, I can put that on a Raspberry Pi, um, or I mentioned for me on cloud earlier, we um, have Nomad uh, as, a, as our orchestrator for WebAssembly there. Um, but the part that is really exciting and in the context of Kubernetes is there's a project called SpinCube that enables you to put, to run WebAssembly applications on any Kubernetes cluster. So I'm gonna talk about that one a little. So SpinCube, um, we announced a few months back um, at a KubeCon North America keynote, we announced, announced that we're submitting it as a sandbox project or incubating project to um, the CNCF. But what it comprises of is four projects that several, that four companies, four projects, four companies, have been working on um, over the past year or so. Um, and that is the spin operator, which is your entry experience into SpinCube. And if you're familiar with Kubernetes, an operator is essentially um, a custom resource, and that custom resource is, uh, describes our spin application, and then an operator that's listening to changes to it. So we have a spin operator that will listen for our spin app custom resource and create Kubernetes deployments for you. And then we have the um, container dshim. And so this is what enables us to run WebAssembly applications on Kubernetes. So um, it's a shim that sits under container D, and it essentially will execute your WebAssembly application instead of executing a container. And the way, and you have to somehow get this shim on your nodes. So instead of having to manually do that, we have the runtime class manager that folks at Liquid Reply worked on. And it used to be called KWASM, if you've heard of that. And what that does is it essentially will prepare all your nodes with the shim. And then finally, we have a plugin, the spin cube plugin, that makes it so that you have that extended CLI experience. So you now have spin cube in order to scaffold up your custom resource. And Looking at all of those parts um, all together in a diagram, this is the flow of it. So we went through the spin new, spin build um, step, and then with the spin registry push, now my WebAssembly um, binary is now up in 
um, an OCI registry, and then I can now use SpinCube, the plugin, to scaffold up my custom resource and apply it to my cluster just as I would any other custom resource. And the spin operator sees that, it creates a deployment of apps, and that sounds weird um, to say a deployment of apps, but um, in reality, those are WebAssembly um, spin applications, and, um, and the way that that works is we add a runtime class to it that tells Container D to execute it with the shim instead of, uh, with the spin shim instead of executing as a container. Okay, so let's take our demo that we just did and extend it for spin cube. So right now I have a three node cluster um, with uh, one control plane node, two user nodes, and let's go ahead and look at some of um, our services here. So I mentioned the runtime class manager, um, which is also called KWASM, and you can see we have three completed jobs. So that was the job that loaded that shim on each of those nodes. And then we have our spin operator, which is sitting there listening for a spin app. So we already built um, our application over here, still running. So we already built our application, so the next step was pushing it to a registry. So we can do spin registry push. And I'm gonna use ttl.sh. It's a really cool ephemeral anonymous registry, so you can use it for demos and local development if you wanna temporarily push something somewhere. We'll call it Open Source Summit Spin Demo, and we can set um, a lifetime of it. We'll just say five hours. Um, great. So that's going to push our spin application up to ttl.sh. Great, that's been pushed. And now we're ready to um, apply it to our cluster. So if I do a spin cube scaffold, and then specify our image, This is our custom resource definition. So this is saying I'm going to apply two replicas of my application to my cluster. Um, we're gonna use the shim, and this is where you can extend into all these different functionalities that SpinCubes provides for you. I'm not gonna dive into that, but everything you know and love about Kubernetes, like liveness probes, resource um, and memory requests and limits, uh, resource requests and limits, et cetera, you can extend in this custom resource definition. And so now we can apply this to our cluster. And watch as our application gets ready. And so now our pods are running and let's go ahead and port forward this. So we can just test it out. And there we go. So that was how we seamlessly went from local with our serverless uh, spin application to our cluster. And so I want to get a little to why this, uh, this is important. So, and, and how we've seen this already have some benefits. So, um, the Zeiss group uh, was previously um, using a containerized solution for serverless, and they switched to using SpinCube and saw those benefits. So they had higher density without needing to change their oper operation at all, and um, they actually cut their cost of compute by 60%. And I want to highlight that part of this was because what SpinCube let them do is it let them shift from using x64 base nodes to ARM nodes. So they got performance um, and cost improvements from that. But also when they ran stress tests, they were able, their performance was 43 times faster to execute the same amount of batch workloads. So they saw that in practice by moving to WebAssembly as their unit for serverless on Kubernetes. And I wanna go ahead and give us the chance to try this out. So um, we have, um, at Fermion, we've created kind of a demo application of, of a um, spin application that has a bunch of different components that are triggered by different endpoints, and that is Finicky Whiskers, and Slats the Cat is in the corner. I'm also wearing Slats the Cat. 
And we think of finicky whiskers as the world's most durable manual load generator. And so this is a way that we dem demonstrate how fast WebAssembly is. So you can, um, if you have a laptop, unfortunately this is not mobile friendly. We switched um, originally finicky whiskers or currently today it is running on Fermion Cloud. This is a version that's been ported to run on AKS um, using SpinCube. Um, and Danielle Lancashire at um, Fermion did this and is um, ironic with her subdomain name. Um, so if you want to try it out, go to Finicky Terrible Systems. And before we do that, though, um, because we have the horizontal pod autoscaler enabled, so ideally if we had like a lot of people, we could see if we could make it autoscale. That might not happen today. Um, but I first want to go under the hood and look at the implementation for Finicky Whiskers. So. Um, Finicky Whiskers is open source. We have a repo um, in GitHub under Fermion slash Finicky Whiskers. Um, but I want to look at how we earlier saw a spin.tomol that had one component in it. So we just had that hello component. This one has five different WebAssembly components, uh, one for each different part of our application. So with Finicky Whiskers, you're feeding slats the cat. So we need one component to update the scoreboard. We need another component to write that you fed it um, vegetables to our uh, key value store, and we need another component to have the high high score scoreboard. So, and another one as our file server. So, there's a lot of different components to this application, and each one of these WebAssembly components is spun up upon request. Um, and so, we have all these different components that we've built with our spin build, and then we've applied it to our cluster already. With um, this is an example um, spin app that's been extended to do more. So, our spin application. Um, has to connect to different data resources. So we actually had to configure it to connect to runtime, to connect to um, a key value store, a SQLite database. Um, and, and you can see here we've even set CPU and memory limits. So this is how you're making your serverless application, which is ephemeral, attached to those um, stateful stores. And so um, this has been applied to our cluster. I'm actually, it's a different cluster, so. I'm going to go ahead and log into that one. And we can see we have four replicas of finicky whiskers running right now. And you can see that we have the horizontal pod autoscaler running with it. So we're at our minimum. Uh, we obviously aren't receiving a lot of load because we're scaled all the way down to only four instances. If we were to have like thousands of people who are playing with finicky whiskers, ideally we would see this scale up to meet that demand if needed, and it could go up to 10 uh, pods. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and try out Finicky Whiskers. Um, so we can go to um, Finicky Terrible Systems, and if you all have your laptop, you can try, um, but uh, we can also just watch me play Finicky Whiskers. Um, so you get to choose whether you want to be Slats the Cat or Ninja, and so we're going to be Slats. And basically it's going to tell you to feed Slats, and I'm feeding Slats. And um, I'm realizing that I might need to be in my browser for this. But yeah, so we can, every time we feed slats, we're, um, oh, I'm not doing well with this, am I? Clearly not easy to talk and execute this at the same time. But um, yeah, every time we feed slats, we're triggering another WebAssembly module to run. Um, and you can see we have our high scores after for some reason, my score wasn't working there, so let me see if um, if I go to the browser, if it'll be a little better. Let me try it over. Oh, that's where we were. But um, our scoreboard wasn't working there. Let's try it one more time. Okay, so we're not adding up, but we're. Um, if you want to try this, um, maybe a little, you'll see that the score every time. Oh, now it's going. Okay, well, so. Oh, interesting. Um, but the we are. I'm obviously not very good at this either, and that is also um, something I've learned is that I'm not good at this game. But um, the score will keep updating as you keep feeding slats. And the idea there is, I got the horrible score of six. But with every single click, there was multiple WebAssembly components being triggered. One was. Um, writing to our key value store, another was updating the score, um, and another was like refreshing the page. So all of these are happening within a click. And so you can see within the matter, if you're actually good at this, like 
um, SZY, who got 197 in 30 seconds or so, is triggering around 600 WebAssembly components in that amount of time, which is very impress impressive um, typing speed and WebAssembly speed. So, with that being said, let's go ahead. and go back to. And so that is uh, what I wanted to share about um, serverless and the opportunity it has for sustainable software and then how WebAssembly can actually help us get there. And if you're interested in SpinCube and trying it out, here are some resources. So we have our GitHub. Um, there's also documentation if you want to try it for whatever scenario you're looking for. And then we're on the CNCF Slack under SpinCube. So if you're already there, um, you can join that channel. And then if you personally want to get in touch, um, it's just my name on all the socials, and I'm happy to answer questions um, and any of those as well. Um, and we have, I think, about five, five minutes or so for questions, if anyone has any. Yeah. Yeah, you can use their application of choice. Um, I will say you probably wouldn't choose to use Express since it is an HTTP service and Spin does that for you. So because it is um, a event-driven handler, you actually don't need the HTTP listener that Express provides. But your JavaScript application implementation within your pre-existing Express application, you could just bring over and put in. Um, it, it should be pretty much the same. The only difference will be that Express has its own SDK for what an HTTP like handling that is. So you would just use the spin one, but um, it will look pretty much the same. Like I have, I have an example of using an Express app and a spin app, and it looks almost identical. So there might be a small line or two tweak, but um, the main thing there is that you're not using the Express library anymore because you don't need that HTTP listener. Yeah, so it, the libraries that are supported within Spin um, vary for different ecosystems. I'm not oh, sure for React. Um, I'm pretty sure we can port uh, React straight over, um, but different web frameworks may vary in their supportability to compile to WebAssembly and those libraries being supported. Um, but, the idea, but most should be supported. So you should try, and if you have any issues, definitely let us know. And we have people who have worked on a lot of different demos and tried different scenarios. But the idea is, yes, that, that you should just take your same application and be able to compile it straight to WebAssembly. Yeah, I actually have one of that locally. Um, so um, here I have this application um, that it's very simple. All it does is um, I wanted to show the um, finite isolation of a WebAssembly module, so I just wanted to show that if one WebAssembly module fails, it won't affect for, uh, subsequent requests, which is why I have this random catch on panic. But you'll see here that all it does is it's an echo, so it gets a request and echoes a response. Um, so it just has this simple function. Um, so that's the WebAssembly version. And then if we go to the container version, so this is an Express app here. Um, it looks very similar, so it just gets a request and it panics if it gets the word panic and otherwise responds. And this is the Express um, application. And um, I have built this, but we can just, we're really just doing this live, I guess, now. Um, and we'll do a, 
Okay, we'll just build and call it Express. So um, this is my Docker file for this. So I've just taken it and moved the application over. And then let's do a... I don't know if y'all can see this. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean PS. So, um, what did I name this again? Express? Um, so yeah, our Express app is 219 megabytes if it's containerized. Do you see that? I, I don't know if it's big enough. Um, and my cursor is right over it. So let's go look at the WebAssembly equivalent one and do a spin build. And um, That is three megabytes. So, yeah, a lot smaller. Right, just take your business logic that was in that Express application and put it within the spin application. Yeah. And if you run into issues, uh, we have a Discord also um, that I can point you to or it's in our documentation. Uh, that we're always listening to and can help uh, debug things because I'm sure someone has the same question as you too. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah. Um, so one of them is that you might be wondering JavaScript's an interpreted language. So uh, one part of that is that we actually compile the interpreter to WASM as well. Um, so they're a little bigger of WebAssembly binaries because of that reason. There is some work to be able to compile it once, the interpreter, and have multiple components share that interpreter. Um, it's also, um, they're working on optimizing it currently. So actually the SDK I just used is, um, we're about to put out a new SDK that's even faster. We've changed um, the underlying um, interpreter that we're using for WebAssembly and it's going to be even faster. So I guess what I would have said is, we had a slower SDK and now it's gonna be a little faster. Um, but the point of that also is that the WebAssembly community is really evolving. So um, we're trying to make things faster and faster as we go along. But for example, right now with the older SDK, JavaScript applications are slower than, um, than for example, REST ones or Go ones. But they're still really fast. Like um, if we were to um, go into our example again, and do a spin up again and just like bombardier it real quick. Um, like I said, this should be sub milliseconds. So I hope that is, um, yeah. So our average latency was um, like 0.7 milliseconds per request. So it's still very fast. I'm just saying when people talk about WebAssembly, they get really nitty and want it really fast. Um, but yeah, it's still quite fast. Um, you can write asynchronous applications and it, that can compile down to a WebAssembly component. Um, we haven't talked about WASI, uh, which is the WebAssembly systems interface. And WASI 0.2 um, just happened, which was a standardization of all these interfaces. WASI 0.3 brings out more interfaces and the one they're focusing on is async. And when I say that, what I mean is WASI 0.3 is gonna make it so that the host runtime can call one component, and when that component's awaiting, it can call another. So that level of asynchronicity isn't, isn't available, but within the component, you can still use like async and wait and awaits and such like that. I think. I'm pretty sure it's the lat. Oh, I also have not been repeating your questions, but for TypeScript, um, the question was, is it transpiled before converting it to WebAssembly or is the transpiler also compiled to WebAssembly? Um, pretty positive it's transpiled before. Um, and uh, we do that, like we do that for you. You don't have to think about that. That's a part of your spin build. We have that built into our JavaScript plugin. Yeah. Um, I think we're at time, but um, I'll be up here if people have any other questions and um, I appreciate you all coming. Thank you.